it's great news that plant protein can be just as anabolic as animal protein. Why? Because there's so much evidence suggesting that when you swap calories from animal protein for plant protein, you're reducing your risk of so many different chronic diseases that we would all rather avoid, right? So it seems like it seems like a win-win to me. But I've even seen I've even seen Lane try and you know twist data like the Maximova study, which yeah. I know you've you've kind of double clicked on a number of times, many times, yeah. But it seems that that Lane is not prepared to to support the statement that people would benefit from consuming less animal protein and more plant protein for these other outcomes outside of of strength and outside of hypertrophy. Yeah, one classic example of that will be the Maximova study, which you actually discussed with him on a podcast, if I recall. And, and this was a study out of Canada that that he often references where they looked at red meat intake, uh, both processed and unprocessed, and cancer risk but in the context of either low, moderate, or high fruit and vegetable intake. And basically they found that if you're consuming plenty of fruits and vegetables, and I can't recall the exact number of servings there, um, that unprocessed red meat was not associated with a higher risk of cancer. But some issues that I would take with this, and I know you brought them up, is that for one, the high meat intake was less than a serving a day. It was maybe 500 grams a week or so. Um, and usually when it comes to cancer risk, or at least colorectal cancer risk, we're looking at at least 100 grams a day or about 700 grams a week. So it was certainly falling south of that. Now, in addition to that, they pooled cancers together. So they looked at total cancer risk, and they looked at 15 cancers lumped together. And when we look at unprocessed red meat intake, it's most strongly associated with colorectal cancer and potentially associated with a few other cancers like pancreatic or prostate. And so it doesn't make sense to conclude that, oh, there's no risk because it didn't increase your overall cancer risk when it could have increased colorectal cancer risk, but because it didn't affect all these other cancers, you just don't really see a result there. Plus, you're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, which might lower risks of other cancers. And so I don't like the framing there. Now, what I particularly dislike where he goes beyond just the the cancer discussion is he often uses that to suggest that that if you're eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, unprocessed red meat is not problematic, full stop. There's no discussion of cardiovascular risk. There's no discussion of all-cause mortality or other outcomes. Right. So it, it doesn't make yeah, sense. So to there's, there's two real big problems there, or three. One is this was specific to cancer, so let's not extrapolate it outside of cancer. Two, the subjects in this study were not consuming a lot of red meat. So let's not extrapolate that to red meat doesn't increase risk of cancer because like what dose are we talking about uh, at all? And three, the strongest evidence for red meat associating with cancer, like to your point, is colorectal cancer. And we might not be seeing that effect when you just lump in all f other forms of cancer Exactly. to that. So how do you interpret that study? I mean... I don't think there's much to interpret, to be honest. It, I mean, it, it suggests that, look, at that level of intake, which is a, we'll say, modest level of intake of unprocessed red meat, if you're eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, then your overall cancer risk does not seem to be higher than somebody who's eating a lower red meat diet, again, with plenty of fruits and vegetables. That is the takeaway. It, it doesn't tell us about specific cancers. It doesn't tell us about higher levels of intake, so a serving a day or more. Um, and so I, I just, and it doesn't tell us about heart disease risk or other outcomes. So it, it just needs to be interpreted in the way that it's presented, and, and that's exactly what it tells us. And then, of course, I'm I'm still waiting patiently for Lane to come back to me on on that other study, and you know the one I'm talking about here. The healthy aging study, yes, uh, out of the nurses health study. So um, this study was looking at uh, something in the ballpark of 30 or 40,000 women in the nurses health study followed for nearly three decades. And they were looking at um, this sort of criteria that they made for what's considered healthy aging. So this was being free of 11 chronic diseases, being in good mental health, not having a cognitive impairment and not having uh, impairments in physical function. So those four things. And they found that higher protein intake was associated with a greater odds of healthy aging. And so when Lane cites that, he's correct. However, he doesn't seem to emphasize how the results were different between plant protein and animal protein. So just to summarize really quick, 
a 3% increase in as a percentage of calories in animal protein from uh, uh, non-dairy sources was associated with a 7% greater odds of healthy aging. From dairy sources, a 14% greater odds of healthy aging. However, from plant sources, 38% greater odds of healthy aging. So it's a massive right. difference. And that detail, my memory of his video was that he sort of celebrated this. He did say plant protein did well, but he sort of celebrated this as just a win for protein overall. And and like this is where, uh, like you compared to what? If you're comparing some of these animal protein sources, um, like, you know, whether it's total animal protein or whether it's dairy animal protein to like refined grains, hyper palatable, high calorie foods. Sure. Maybe there's a benefit there. Um, but in their substitution analysis, plant protein beat out every single nutrient they looked at. So it beat out total carbohydrates. It beat out refined carbohydrates, unsurprisingly. It beat out carbohydrates from whole grain foods. It beat out total fat, saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, animal protein, and dairy protein. Right. Every single one and of it was tested. it was actually big. So if yeah. you looked at, and you probably have this in front of you, but I believe uh, for a 3% of calorie substitution from animal protein for plant protein. So in that case, it's non-dairy animal protein. So it could be like red meat swapping out for 3% of um, calories, calories coming from protein from tofu, for example. It was almost a... 40% higher odds of healthy aging. Yeah, and, and let's put this in context. We're talking 3% of calories. So in a 2,000 calorie diet, that's 15 grams of protein. So swapping just 15% or sorry, 15 grams 15 of protein grams. from animal protein to plant protein leads to that substantial of a benefit. That's crazy. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health. And I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher, Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.